Welcome everyone. My name is Allison Van Dyke and I'm the Executive Director of the Temple of Understanding. And I am very excited about our program today, Taking Action on Climate Chaos, an interfaith dialogue from various traditional religious perspectives. I uh, wanna explain a little bit about the Temple of Understanding, which is a 62 year old interfaith organization whose mission is to advocate for interfaith values in the secular setting of the United Nations, as well as around the world. Our focus for the past 12 years has been basically to increase the awareness of religious leaders and actors about our climate crisis and its negative impact on achieving the UN's sustainable development goals. And in particular, those are peace, justice, women's health and safety, food sovereignty, and environmental activism. Today, we have representatives in our dialogue from the Buddhist tradition, the Christian tradition, and the Islamic traditions. And I'd like to begin with Dr. Daniel Capper, who is here with us already in the Zoom. Uh, Dr. Capper is a, is a PhD. He is a recently retired professor from the University of, the Southern, of Southern Mississippi, where he taught Asian religions, comparative religions, and research methods. He trained at the University of Chicago in the field of science and religion. In interdisciplinary studies, he explored environmental ethics and their interact, and the interactions with the non-human natural world and compared that with Buddhism. Dr. Tapper's many, many uh, books include Learning Love from a Tiger, Religious Experiences with Nature, Roaming Free Like a Deer, Buddhist and nat the Natural World, and Buddhist Ecological Protection of Space, a Guide for Sustainable Off-Earth -earth Travel, which I do hope he will talk about. Also with us today and moderating is Reverend Susan Henderson, who has served as President of Interfaith Power and Light since 2018. She was raised in the blue collar family outside of Cleveland, Ohio before attending Bethany College in West Virginia, where she graduated with honors with a BA in religious studies. Reverend Hendershot went on to graduate from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, where she received her master's of divinity degree from, sorry here, from uh, Can Candler School of Theology. After graduating, she moved to Iowa where she was ordained in the Christian church, the Disciples of Christ. And she served as a pastor there in the local congregation focusing on social justice. Reverend Hendershot is also led faith-based nonprofit organizations and served as the first Heartland Field organizer for the One Campaign on Global Poverty. Just prior to her current role, she served as the executive director at Iowa Interfaith Power and Light, one of the state's affiliates to her current role. She serves as the executive director of the Interfaith Power and Light Network. Reverend Hendershot believes that climate change is a moral issue, disproportionately impacting those most vulnerable in our world. She gets her motivation and inspiration from her two sons. She lives in Washington, DC. Welcome. Professor Ibrahim Azdemir is a professor of philosophy at Ushkar University in Istanbul, Turkey. He is the Dean of Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. He was the founding president of Hassan Kalyoko, I'm not gonna pronounce this properly, Kalyoko University. <laughs> Maybe you can pronounce it for, for us. Uh, his PhD dissertation was the ethical dimension of human attitude towards nature, which was the first dissertation by a Muslim philosopher on environmental philosophy and ethics. It offers a short but engaging study in Islam and ecology, contributing most substantially 
to environmental discourses by relating the work of Saeed Nursi. His books include Rumi and Confucius on Meaning of Life, The Ethical Dimension of Human Attitude Towards Nature, and Globalization, Ethics, and Islam. He's, he is also mentioned in a book as being one of the most prominent environmentalists in Turkey today. Welcome to all three of you, and I'm now turning the program over to Dr. Hendershot. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and welcome to my esteemed co-panelists. I'm really glad to be with you today. Um, as we begin, just one word of housekeeping. Um, I wanted to share with those who are, who are joining as attendees um, to please feel free to use the chat to share information or uh, you know, any conversation, um, links to resources that you wanna share with others. Um, and then we also invite you uh, as we're having our discussion today, to use the Q&A feature in Zoom at the bottom of your screen um, to ask questions. And so we will do our best to uh, get to those questions. We'll save about 30 minutes um, at the end of our discussion for, for questions, but that will help us keep track of those questions apart from the chat function. Um, so we're gonna have a very robust conversation here today, I'm sure. And then uh, we will be looking forward to hearing from those who are in our audience as well. And feel free to introduce yourselves within the chat function to one another so we know who's, who's joining with us today. We're interested to know who you are and where you are uh, as you are joining today. So again, I want to welcome Dan and Ibrahim to this conversation. I'm very glad that we have this multi-faith discussion before us today. I always feel like I learn so much from these conversations uh, with others in our varying uh, religious traditions. And um, so I wanna, I wanna start um, with you, Dan. I, I, and I wanna ask this first question, which is, um, you know, what are your guiding spiritual or religious principles that motivate your climate-focused work? Oh, all right. Well, within the Buddhist world, um, Buddhists tend to rely strongly on the principle of an interconnected universe. The Buddha taught that our universe is completely interconnected across vast swaths of time and space, because everything arises from at least one cause, nothing in the universe is, in, is independent. And because everything then creates effects, um, basically everything in the physical universe lives within a web of cause and effect relationships. And so this idea that the universe is utterly uh, connected, interconnected uh, across time and space, this is a bedrock notion of the Buddhist spiritual tradition. You cannot realize Buddhist enlightenment without ponder, at least pondering um, this essential principle of Buddhism. So this is uh, what gets me going in terms of environmentalism, recognizing my connections with everything out there. Um, I am not separate from the spiders out there. I am not separate from polar bears who may be seeing their habitats diminish and so on and so on. And so within the Buddhist world, this is where it starts with a sense of interconnection with everything in the natural world. And then um, Buddhists add moral principles to this. The idea of interconnection is, is just a cognitive principle. It's not a moral principle. But Buddhists add to this idea of interconnection moral principles like loving kindness and compassion and non-harm. The idea, for instance, is that we should show non-harm, ahimsa, um, through uh, our webs of interconnections. Because I'm interconnected with a polar bear whose habitat is shrinking, to use the example that I used before, um, according to the Buddhist tradition, what I need to do is respond with loving kindness towards that polar bear, compassion for that polar bear, and a sense of non-harm, 
not wanting that polar bear to get harmed. And um, if you take the um, essential principle of interconnection and you add the ethical principles of compassion and loving kindness and non-harm, uh, you can do a lot of environmental ethics work, um, as I talk about in my book, Roaming Free Like a Deer. So um, this is where it all starts from a Buddhist point of view. I'm really interested to hear what uh, my other panelists have to think about this. Mm, thank you, Dan. Yes, and please jump in, Ibrahim. We're, we are so interested, um, not only in your response to what Dan said, but also um, in your own guiding spiritual or religious principles. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Temple of Understanding and especially Miss Susie for organizing this timely and very important event and bringing us together for a better and deeper understanding of ourselves, our home, planet Earth, and our problems. It was maybe a few decades ago, ago, it was unimaginable to think about, you know, members of different faiths, leaders of different faiths, they are, they are coming together and they are sharing, they are caring, they have concerns, not about only their communities or about their country, but about the whole creation. And most importantly, what we can do together. I, I think this is very, very important because we are not only have climate change problems. Yes, even climate deniers in my country, they began to, to believe that there is a, we have a problem with the nature. We have, we have problems. But besides we have other problems, you know, there are still ongoing wars and refugees, racism, violence, poverty, illiteracy, injustice, and healthy care, health care for, for needy people. I think as people, as members of uh, religious faith, as Dan said, as representing who has a compassion. We have to share our compassion and hope we can reach this, uh, reach out and uh, solve these problems. So I think, you know, uh, this is, uh, it doesn't matter, you know, environmental problems and other problems. They do not discriminate whether we are Christians, Jew, Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim or secular. So uh, we must cooperate and join our energies for a better future as the threat is common. Let me, I just want to, you know, if the ideologies of 19th and 20th century were successful, we were not going not to talk these issues. They will solve all our problems. They, they couldn't. They couldn't provide a meaningful life, a satisfactory life, you know, besides the problem is created by these ideologies, but they cannot provide a meaningful life, a compassionate life for the people, for, for the humanity and for the creation. This is why I, I, I used the, the book of Houston, the late uh, Professor Houston Smith, this, his seminal book, the Why Religion Mat Mat Matters in 21st Century. Because you see, he said, the world is dominated by materialism, consumerism, educational elitism, and governmental and legal system without morality, without a comp moral compass. So this is the gist of the problem. This is why, Religion matters more than ever, as religion is the only entity to give humanity a sense of purpose and belonging, and 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 and, and, and as Dan said, has a, a sympathy for the polar bear, for the extinct animals. This is why I I see it, 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 this gathering is very very important, and because we should never forget that it is a moral imperative for us, us to respect the rights of future generations to live in a sustainable and prosperous and healthy environment. And come, when I come as a Muslim religion, uh, as a Muslim, you know, when I look at the pre-Islamic Arabs perception of nature and to see what the Quran or, uh, or the sacred text, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the change it, it brought, I see, you know, the, in short, the four Arabs before Islam, the nature was meaningless, purposeless, and, uh, you know, as a result of a chaotic, you know, uh, random uh, chaotic processes. But the, with the first verses, the Quran began to change and challenge this world with uh, that there is a God who created with purpose, with meaning, with balance. This is, and also when we look at who is this God 
And it is the God of Abraham. It is the God of Moses and this God of Jesus. Um, we have just some, you know, even within the Christianity, there are different perceptions of God, but the God is the same God. So he created, when, when we look at the, what is the, 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 the attributes of this God, Quran presents us the most, uh, you know, important uh, attributes of his is all compassionate and all uh, merciful. But unfortunately, we Muslims, we cannot develop an ethics of compassion. But we are uh, also, you know, we, this is, uh, I am working you now in recent years on an new ethic of compassion. And this is why I, as I studied, uh, you know, philosophy from philosophy to the Buddhism and from Buddhism and also to all. Then I saw you know, all great masters, they have, they know, they know what compassion is. So I think here we, it is time to, to develop an ethics of compassion. It is a more imperative for us, not only care for ourselves, you know, the, the, the nation state mentality, which is a, a product of 19th, again, 20th century, just imposed on us through our educational systems to just only care for our countries. But the COVID-19 pandemic teaches us that, that this pandemic does not recognize national borders. So the other environmental problems and climate change problems. This is where we can start and we show the world. We, care for you, we care for future generations, we care for all uh, creatures. Because uh, up to me, for the 13th century uh, uh, Sufi poet Yunus Emre says, we, create, we, we love all creatures, all creation, just because of the creator. This is the bond, this is the ethical bond, you know, connects us to the creator. Therefore, we have to care about creation. Mm, really beautifully said. And you know, I hear this theme with both of you talking about compassion and non-harming. You know, I love the the framing of the ethics of compassion because I've I've often thought about um, the ethics of love, right? This is very similar idea, you know, in terms of our framing and and you know, I, in in the Christian tradition, of course, um, you know, I also begin with the creation story. Um, you know, the 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 idea that that God saw that it was good. It was all good, you know, not just humans, the, the, the whole world, the whole created universe was good. And humans were appointed as stewards over the creation, you know, not to, not to, uh, you know, we, we like, we like uh, in, in the Christian tradition, sometimes to think of that as subduing the earth, uh, or having, you know, we use dominion, uh, we use dominion language, uh, as a way to sort of justify the harm that we do. But in, in reality, uh, humans were appointed as stewards. And we when we think about the language of stewardship, it's very different than the language of dominion. Um, you know, what do we do as stewards? But we care for the gift that was given um, for future generations, just, just as you were uh, speaking about, Ibrahim. And so you know, in, in, uh, in the Christian scriptures and in the Hebrew prophets and through Jesus teachings, um, we're admonished also to care for the poor. And I find it really interesting that um, poverty is discussed in the Christian scriptures 300 times. You know, probably more than anything else, right, uh, is, is this um, discussion of poverty and taking care of, of the poor. And so it isn't something that we can just brush aside as Christians and say, well, you know, if we have time, you know, we'll care for the poor. Um, you know, if we have something left over, we'll care for the poor. It's, it's very central, in fact, to our, to our teachings. And so, you know, in my tradition, I think about, um, you know, what, what are we basing our values on? And, you know, and for me, you know, it's these values of faith, uh, of centering justice in our work. So, so making sure that equity and justice are, are a, not only a part of it, but actually central to the work that we do, but also courage, you know, we have to be courageous in this, in this work. Um, hope, which, you know, for me, I, I think hope is an interesting word, right? There, because we use it a lot of different ways. We can say, 
well, you know, I hope everything works out for you, which is a very passive approach to hope. And that's really not the kind of hope that we're talking about. We're talking about uh, this active hope that means that we have to do the work that what we do matters, that we have agency. And so, you know, it's a much more active way of thinking about hope than sort of just standing back and, you know, let others, you know, get involved and take and take action. Um, and, you know, I think about the, the words of the Apostle Paul, who said, faith without works is dead. And I think that is so applicable to the crisis that we find ourselves in right now, that we have to work. <laughs> there is work to be done. And so we must have faith that we can do it and that uh, we are, um, you know, that we are working with God and not against God, um, but there is work involved. It's not just waiting and anticipating others to take action. Um, so I just, I just love um, this, you know, this, this centering that both of you put in compassion, in non-harming, uh, in, in the interconnectedness, I, I think the, the, the Buddhist idea of, of interconnectedness uh, and interbeing, as I know Thich Nhat Hanh has said, is, is just, uh, it, you know, it's a beautiful framework to say that, you know, sort of once you pull one thread, that the ripples are felt, you know, throughout the, the weaving, right? You know, you can't pull one without affecting the whole. And and humans are a part of the whole, we are not the whole in and of ourselves. And I just, it, it sort of, the, there was, a, there was a, a thought that bubbled up for me, um, Ibrahim, in something that you mentioned about ideologies. And, and immediately in my mind, I went to uh, another word with the same root, which is idols idols. And I wondered if either of you wanted to speak to, um, you know, sort of what is it that we are idolizing in, in our culture today, in our world today, um, that is actually limiting our ability to address the issue of the climate crisis. Um, for me, you know, I can think of energy, money, <laughs> you know, um, the fossil fuels, you know, it's the, a number of sort of idols that I think we, um, we have in our society. And I wondered if either of you had any, any thoughts on that. Yes, Dan, you first, please. Oh, you are on mute. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Okay. Well, um, as uh, Susan just touched on, to me, uh, one of the great idols of our society that impacts the way we deal with climate change is our materialism. It's our worship of stuff. Uh, you can see it in advertisements. You can see it when you go into stores and watch people shop. You can see it in the way that people talk about the stuff that they have. Um, there's a deep acquisition drive that we seem to have that runs against climate change. If we're going to uh, successfully battle climate change, if we're going to successfully clean up our planet, um, we need to do a little bit of belt tightening, not belt loosening. But there are still so many people who are um, not concerned by climate, not concerned by the non-human natural world around them, but instead are still just concerned with acquiring more and more stuff. And um, this seems to me like a, a, a real problem for us to overcome. Um, we're so ingrained by our cultures to think that the, the more stuff we have, the more successful in life we are. And it seems to me that the climate change age is trying to teach us the opposite lesson. And we're not always learning that well. What do you think, Ibrahim? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to add, you know, uh, uh, as I said, uh, Houston Simit was aware of that. This is why he said materialism and consumerism is the old major idols, you know. So, in fact, uh, Eric Fromm, Eric Fromm, the uh, psychiatrist, philosopher, and sociologist, was aware of that uh, in 1960s. He said, you know, it's gonna be, you know, 
consumer culture. People we try to be have more and more and try to be happy. No, and 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 we just discovered that we, happiness is not connected to the material uh, and uh, to, to 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 your consumption patterns. So uh, we we have to understand this first. Then I I, I think uh, you know uh, 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 Susan, uh, you said what you said about uh, hope is very very important, and this is why people is uh, uh, expecting from us. We had uh, an, uh, again an inter. Uh, uh, faith uh, meeting at the Nobel Peace Institute in, in Oslo two years ago, and our keynote speaker was, was uh, pro Professor Fuku uh, Francis Fukuyama. He presented us a very bleak picture of the future. And I, I said, you know, when I look at it, your, uh, your data, I also sometimes I get uh, stressed and I, I, I almost uh, you know, uh, uh, at the edge of to 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 to, ho to to lose my hope, but my belief in an omnipotent and all merciful and all compassionate God, it's not compatible with the hopelessness. I have to be hope. I have to keep hope in my heart. And he said a very good, you know, uh, he made a very good remark. He said, "This is why we invited you. And this is this is this is the peculiar feature of religious people." In the face of everything, they always have hope in their heart. So I think, yes, we have idols, yes, we have problems, and but we can uh, we can show people, share with people, there is a hope. And this is why we are here. And this is why I said I said I, I, I celebrated this meeting and other meetings, you know. We are, you know, we are doing something good. Uh, I, I, therefore, uh, if we just, you know, uh, keep this uh, spirit of uh, co cooperation and learning from each other, and we will, we will, we will overcome this. And I just, you know, I, and again, I, I, I remember um, the late Mary Oliver, the poet Mary Oliver's last interview. When asked, what uh, do you do when you wake up in the morning? And she said, I start my day reading a poems from Rumi, then I go for a walk with my dog. And why? What do you learn from a 13th century Sufi poet? And she said, Rumi teaches me to kiss the ground and give me 100 reasons. We have to, you know, it is not only to the materialism and conception culture. We have to understand the ground, we have to understand the soil, we have to understand the trees, we have to understand the forest, we have to understand the whole system. We are not the master. We are only a citizen of the, the world, universe. We have to be humble. We have to, be, to walk on, on, on the face of the earth uh, with, uh, as a humble servant of God. And when I look at, you know, look at the, 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 the world in many religious people, you know, because of colonization, because of the co problem we, we inherited from nation state mentality or from ideologies, they are still, you know, they, they don't, you know, they, they have a different, uh, you just assume they are coming, uh, they, are, they came from a different planet to, 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 concur, to concur the, 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 the nature, then, but what, to, to what expense? Beautiful. And the fact that you just, you know, quoted one of my favorite poets of all time. <laughs> it just, just kind of builds the connection. Um, Mary Oliver uh, is just- but a... let, me, let me remind that the <laughs> poets, you cannot put poets in between national borders. They belong all the world. This is why it's Rumi, and this is why it then is interested in Buddha. <laughs> you, can, you can't say it, it belongs to India. They are so great. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Those are my favorite poets, you know. <laughs> and and I have books on my shelf over here, uh, books of poetry by Rumi and books of poetry by Mary Oliver, along with many others um, uh, that are just beautiful. And I, I'm going to quote a, a, a very tiny uh, Mary Oliver poem, uh, which says uh, that that God had a plan, I do not doubt, but what if God's plan was that we would do better? <laughs> and, and I just have always been struck by that, you know, sort of that, you know, our agency, our, you know, our, 
the 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 commitment that we need to have um, to do better and um and it leads me into sort of this you know another another question um for you about why you know why all of us believe it's critical for for our faith leaders to speak to the issue of climate change and environmental justice and you know for me personally i I sit here in the Eastern US and I look around and I see, you know, all of these climate emergencies that are affecting us here, that are affecting the global community, you know, significant flooding and wildfires, of course, the deadly heat waves that we have seen this summer um, all over the world that are, um, you know, that are literally killing people, you know, this, this very deadly heat. Um, and we all also know that, you know, the, those who suffer first and worst and longest from these emergencies are the poor. It is those who have been historically disenfranchised from policymaking and decision making. And, you know, for me, this is, you know, a very compelling reason for religious leaders to speak on the issue of climate change and environmental justice. We, you know, we are called to care for creation, to care for our sacred earth, you know, whatever our language is around the earth, um, and called to care for those who are suffering. And climate change, of course, destroys the earth and it destroys those who are already suffering. And so, you know, for me, it is that prophetic role that religious leaders have to speak truth to power, just like, of course, in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, when we look at the prophets who, you know, very clearly spoke truth to power, you know, they, they laid out the situation as it existed and they called people to change their behavior and to live into a new reality, but they also did it, and I, I think this is significant, in a way that provides hope. It's not to say nothing can change or nothing can get better, it's to say, if we change, then things can improve and we can be sort of, if you will, led back to the promised land, right? Whatever, whatever that means for us. Um, and I think that that is a very significant reason um, for religious leaders to speak on the issue of climate change. But I also see not only the prophetic voice, but I think in today's world, the role of the faith leaders is also to provide sort of a practical role. In other words, leading their congregations to invest in renewable energy to take care of greening their facilities so to take on very practical actions that actually also help with solutions and uh, a third role is pastoral because we know that people are suffering both physically and emotionally and mentally from the tolls of climate change and that pastoral care role i think is ever more important um, for, for all of our religious communities as people are facing this kind of devastation and grief. So, you know, that's sort of my take on, um, you know, why I believe it's critical for faith leaders to speak on this issue. And uh, Ibrahim, I'm going to turn to you and ask you what you think, uh, you know, why you believe it's, it's critical for faith leaders to speak on the issue of climate change. I think this eco justice is is one of most important uh, issue we have to handle with. We have to uh, make uh, it clear to everybody. This is why I just appreciate you know the new the new uh, law passed in the Congress in, on Sunday about uh, you know uh, to 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 relieve uh, senior citizens and also uh, needy people in the U.S. So the, we, we are in a global village, you know, when there's something good is happening somewhere, it is just will happen somewhere else. But just two months ago, we, 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 we lived the, uh, the month of Ramadan. We can see how Ramadan educated and trained us uh, in one month, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to feel the, 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 the psychology of the, the needy people. Then I also observe how, how there was a solidarity and, there was a cooperation in the society. 
between between the rich and and the, the, the poor people it was immense but we this this is not enough this is why as eco justice you know we are talking about you know to to a new maybe tax to to ultra rich people because they are using the resources of the planet when i visit some african countries they are so you know they are so uh, disabled to educationally and also economically they cannot solve their own problems be, be, besides they are not the creators of the problem they are just left over there so we with the spirit of you know uh, the compassion and also our religious connection we have to care for these people and we have to uh, to develop an, a new system a new you know uh, economic model which is sustainable the present economic model it is not sustainable everybody know accept this uh, accepting this so we have to create we have to design and develop a new uh, economic system which is sustainable which is good for the all so uh, let me just say the prophet muhammad uh, uh, peace be upon him says in one of saying when your neighbor is uh, is hungry if you go to the bed with a full stomach you are not one of you are not belong to my community and he doesn't says your neighbor muslim neighbor he says the neighbor because if if your next door neighbor is hunger uh, it, it, it is hungry and it is uh, it it lives in a in, in in a poverty it means it it will cause a lot of problems psychological problems economic problems security problems because when people when we, we all know about the uh, abraham maslow's hierarchy hierarchy of needs so we have to address basic human needs we have to we have to find a way this is why the scientists and the also all social scientists and also other uh, government leaders they have to work with religious leaders with religious community how all religious legacies can help us to overcome this problem only with laws just changing us maybe not enough we have to change our hearts first definitely the role of religious leaders to work on changing hearts. Uh, and Dan, I want to bring you into this conversation as well and, and think about um, your perspective on why you believe it's critical for faith leaders to speak on this issue. Uh, right. Um, you two have hit on some really important points here. Um, uh, I'm going to amplify some of your points and um, talk about a few different things, perhaps. Um, the Dalai Lama, for instance, has been a very active religious leader in terms of um, trying to respond to environmental issues. He's produced a number of essays. He's uh, uh, given a number of speeches on environmental issues. And in this way, he has um, stimulated Tibetan Buddhists to be better actors in the face of climate change you can see how the Dalai Lama's words and the Dalai Lama's leadership has resulted in um, concrete actions in the Tibetan Buddhist community. This highlights really how terribly important it is for our religious leaders to take charge in the climate change age and show real leadership in the face of um, the problems that are spawned all around us. Um, and these problems are intersectional. They cut across different humans, as you guys have been talking about, um, and across different species as well. Um, the environmental sociologist, David Nagy Pello, has the concept of total liberation, in which he talks about how being truly green, being truly functional in an environmental way, um, means integrating concerns not just of rich humans, as usually happens, but also taking into account the, the real negative effects that can happen on poor humans. And at the same time, that can happen on animals and their ecosystems. That is, if you look at the record, you find that lots and lots of times, while dolphins are suffering, and while dolphin habitats are suffering, so are poor and dispossessed humans. So to respond to one thing like um, environmental degradation is to respond to 
very human issues at the same time, um, as you folks have pointed out here. Um, so for instance, uh, climate change is a product mostly of the rich and affluent in the world, and at least as much and sometimes more, it is poor people who bear the brunt of the negative effects of climate change. And if I'm a young person growing up, let's say in Botswana today, I may be hopping mad because the, the citizens of the affluent United States have helped to create a climate change world, um, which I did not help to create if I'm growing up in Botswana, and I may not have much purchase in. That is, um, I may not have a car to drive. I may not have electrical devices to run that, that will run on coal power and so on and so on. And so we need our religious leaders to take charge to make sure that there's a sense of fairness among humans when it comes to negative climate change outcomes. We need to do a much better job of making sure that um, those who are polluting are the ones who pay and that innocent people in, in, uh, uh, um, in places that may not be that responsible for, for global warming, that these innocent people have their needs taken care of. And to do so, according to uh, Pelo's um, ideology, his way of looking at things, and I think he's right about this, to look after the poor people in this way is also to look after non-human species who have been negatively impacted and also to look out for their environments. Um, another reason, and Susan touched on this, another reason why religious leadership is terribly important today in the face of global warming um, it has to do with pastoral care issues. Uh, climate change has spawned climate denial, where some people deny that there are even climate problems. And we can talk about this as a, a dysfunctional uh, form of mental health operation. Um, but there's also those who are climate fatigued. They are not in denial of climate change, but they are so beaten down by hearing about it all the time that maybe they do not rouse to action the way that they really should. And then there are those who are um, uh, uh, given to climate despair, where they say, oh, we're screwed. We're going to heck in a handbasket. There's nothing we can do. And whether we're talking about climate deniers those in climate fatigue, or uh, these people in climate despair that I was just talking about, our religious leaders can play a very important role in helping to stem dysfunctional attitudes and create more positive, um, more innovative um, uh, intellectual options for their flock so that more and more people are stimulated to act positively in the face of climate change, rather than just give up or go into denial. That is when it comes to navigating the mental health problems that are um, being spawned by the climate change age, it is uh, our religious leaders who are crucial in helping, leader, uh, helping different people through uh, the different pitfalls that can happen. Because climate change is not just a an environmental issue. It is also a human psychological issue and a very important one. Then let me just, you know, uh, share with you one of my unforgettable mem memories with uh, Her Highness Dalai Lama in 1990. We had a lunch in Cape Town, and then I saw the interest of young generation to him, asking questions, taking photos with him. And I just, as he was next to my, at the table next to me, I said, His Highness, what is the reason these young people, you know, they are, uh, they, uh, they are so attracted by you? And he said, you know, if they are satisfied, this is human spirit, he said, never satisfied with the, the, the materialism. It means everything with materialism. We have, you know, higher longings in our heart. This, they are searching for some higher, you know, uh, high uh, uh, ideals. I am, with all my humbleness, I am trying to help them. And now, it, all the religious leaders, you know, we have to reach out this young generation. Otherwise, they will 
they will they 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 they, they will try every you know uh, 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 um, uh, uh, things to 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 forget this. This is why Dracus is so on high. I don't like this. Is, this is you know they, again they 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 try to find the solution in another materialism, but the solution is not there. We have to show this. And the other one, uh, just uh, four years after this, I met Mr. Gorbachev in, in Lyon, in France, and I also asked, I, I, uh, I asked him in person, I said, why do you interested in environmentalism and also the part of uh, green, heart, green Cross movement? And he said, because as a last president of a communist state, ideologists cannot satisfy our spiritual needs. We have to understand religions from a new. With all experiences, with all our experiences, we have rediscovered our legacy, religious legacy. Right, right. I, on that note, you you mentioned young people, and they are especially important here. It seems to me, um, there's a, a saying in the academic world that science advances one funeral at a time, because people get attached to ideas, and then. The only way for new ideas to percolate up is to have the old folks die off and let the new ideas come up. And um, perhaps we have kind of the same thing here with climate change. There are people who have gray hair like I do, um, who have fixed attitudes towards climate change that are not always very healthy. Whereas the younger generation coming up sees things differently. They live in a different world. In the 1970s, no one talked about climate change. But if you're under 30, um, then people have been talking about climate change your entire life. And you have a, a different perspective on things. And so it seems to me especially important uh, for us, we're talking about reaching out with religions. It seems to me especially important to be reaching out in spiritual ways to the younger generation, since they are really going to have to, whether they want to or not, they are going to have to carry a heavy climate change load. Mm -hmm. Dan, I mean, I think you've just really hit on something, and, and both of you have, uh, which is the spiritual longing, right? This, and and I think about the fact that in the U.S., you know, of course, we think about church membership as. Uh, declining in many ways, especially in, in, in sort of the mainstream denominational bodies, you know, church membership is declining and the age of the members is getting older as fewer and fewer young people are, are engaged in institutional forms of religion. And, um, and yet, you know, we talk about the spiritual but not religious group of people, you know, uh, that's how we frame it here in the US is spiritual but not religious. And so there is this like deep longing for the spiritual connection and, and folks are finding it in, you know, in a number of, of new and interesting ways. Um, and, you know, I, I think about that in, in thinking about the work that the, the religious community brings to climate, the issue of climate change, because in many ways, you know, and, and uh, you referred to it earlier talking about materialism, for example, is, you know, there's, there's a, a need for a deeper, I will use the word transformation, right? There's, there's, and, and so I think about the spiritual transformation of, you know, an individual, you know, sort of their deeper longing or deeper spiritual connection but that transformation, I think, is also the role of the religious community or the spiritual communities when it, when it comes to the issue of climate change, because we need a transformation, right? We need to understand, I think, that many of the problems that we have created uh, in the world in terms of environmental degradation, environmental injustice, um, climate change, it, it, they're, they're related so closely to this materialism, this search for more and more and more that we have that sort of drives our energy use, has driven um, 
people to degrade the earth and, you know, uh, mountaintop removal mining and, you know, all kinds of things that we can think of that are causing real harm to not only the earth, but to, you know, the creatures, uh, other humans, you know, people who are, who are living near oil and gas drilling, who are suffering from, you know, uh, respiratory and, and, uh, you know, asthma, dis you know, disorders, um, higher cancer rates, you know, all of these things that are so interconnected to what we're doing to the earth. And so I think about this, you know, this idea of spiritual transformation as a way to get to this broader, you know, economic and uh, justice transformation that we need uh, in our world. And so I'm just curious, you know, uh, maybe Dan, if you want to jump in, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on that, because um, it seems like, you know, in many ways, young people are are leading us, you know, in this way, they're, they're leading a different kind of spiritual transformation than maybe the one that we've been traditionally used to. Right, that's an uh, interesting insight. Um, without a doubt, there are young people like Greta Thunberg who are leading the charge in terms of the world, um, uh, in, in terms of environmentalism around the world. She's a, uh, an easily recognizable figure in many different countries. Um, I, I think that the youth are going to have to take the lead here um, and uh, really sponsor a different type of echo spirituality, perhaps, than we have seen before. Um, there are limitations to traditional spiritualities when it comes to the climate change age, and we should actually expect some of these limitations. Uh, for instance, the Buddha never heard of climate change. It was not a concept that he entertained. So we should not expect his teachings to be, you know, perfect out of the box for the climate change age. We need to adapt things. And uh, it's going to be especially the younger generation, I think, that comes up with some very interesting echo spiritual adaptations so that we can feel closer and more integrated with non-human nature. This has been a, a stumbling block of some traditional spiritualities which tried to divide humans from the rest of the natural world. And I think what we're seeing, and it's being driven by young people, is a, a transformation of more integrative eco-spiritualities where humans are seen more and more as part and parcel of non-human nature, not as agents who stand out over and against it. And and control it. Um, and I think we're going to find more examples of how echo spirituality and new forms of economic thinking um, uh, up here. Ibrahim is absolutely right about this. Our economic models that are uh, that we have inherited don't help us very much in the climate change age. And we need to rethink our economics as we rethink our spirituality. And I think that um, the younger generation that is around us today will come up with some um, very novel ways of understanding new economic uh, modes of operation in conjunction, hand in hand, with new spiritual modes of operation, again, in conjunction, hand in hand, with new modes of realizing a deeper human belongingness in the non-human natural world. And, and I see some of this developing around me. It's, it's hard to look 10 years down the road and see who will be successful and who won't. But it is interesting to see lots of ideas being thrown around and lots of new approaches appearing around us. And for me, this is one thing that gives me hope for the future. Fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And Ibrahim, I want to uh, want you to jump in I, here. I, I just I just want to uh, sh share again with you. Uh, I was in Nairobi attending a UNEP meeting in 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 March in, uh, uh, 2019, and it was Friday, and I went out to see uh, if there is a, a, a school strike in support of Gerard Thunberg. Then, to my surprise, I saw many young uh, uh, Kenyan students, they are on the streets. Then I just 
to provoke them, I said, oh my, my gosh, why up to you? This is a Swedish girl, she's a very rich, you know, why you are supporting her? They say, sir, we don't agree with you. Her message is universal. He, she also cares for Africa, for, for Asia, because her message is universal. This is why she, you know, she has so many supporters in the world. Even in India, some young people got trouble for spreading her ideas. So I have teaching a philosophical counseling course. In, 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 which is, I think, the first in Turkey. Then I took my students to a near, uh, uh, near, a near a forest or, or a park. Then I just teach them some basic techniques to, to touch a tree, to just look at tree in a different way, as his friend, as his mother or she's mother. So how did can I just say, you are from the, the soil. When you see when we are decayed, you know, we are just returned to the soil. And the result is, you know, was surprising for them and for me. They say we never thought we are a part of the nature. Because I thought, I learned this, I was in, in Finland for two years, in, in 2018 and 19. And I saw that they, they have a better education, environmental education. They just start from the kindergarten and they, 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 they present teachers the, uh, the nature as their mother. See, this is mother nature. So it is not only an economic value. It is not only, it, it is not, you know, something to, you can buy and sell. You know, it is, it has an aesthetic dimension. It has a spiritual dimension. So I think this is why I, I then, I, I just uh, also uh, start to give a, a, a course, he designed a course for uh, last five years about critical thinking just to be critical of everything we, uh, we or nation state mentality uh, used to teach us. We have to, we have to be, we have to hear by critic, I mean, we have to look at the universe, look at the nature, look at the whole humanity with a holistic perspective to try to see the whole picture where we, we are a small part. And you see, this is why, you know, I'm also, uh, I'm using the uh, Dr. Frank, uh, Victor Frank book, The Human Search for Meaning, or The Cry of the Meaning. So why all this? He was also aware of this problem. If we can uh, present uh, our young generation a new perception of nature and themselves, I think there's going to be a change in the future. Mm. That's, that's wonderful. And, and yeah, that, that holistic view, you know, I just hear the echoes of, of, of what Dan said earlier about the interconnectedness uh, from the Buddhist perspective as well. So it just goes to show how, how much, you know, our thinking has in common sometimes when we really get to the, the heart of it, right? Um, and, and I, I want to shift us just a little bit in our conversation because um, we know there's very there's a, there are a lot of practical things that are happening um, within uh, faith communities um, and faith bodies when it comes to uh, working on the issue of climate change, um, both individually and together. And um, you know we've been talking a lot about religious leaders and the role of religious leaders and and you know thinking more broadly about people of faith and um, people of all spiritualities, um, you know, there's, there's several roles that, that I see that, you know, people can, can play, you know, there's, there's this uh, pr very practical role of, you know, um, lowering their energy use, for example, um, Interfaith Power and Light works very specifically with congregations uh, around the United States who are working to lower their energy use as an act of faith, you know, so they think about it in terms of living out their values as a, as a faith community. And um, for example, we have some congregations that are working to become, or have already achieved in some cases, becoming zero emissions congregations be, by virtue of energy efficiency and putting up solar and investing in, in other forms of of clean energy use within their facilities and sort of modeling that behavior 
um, for the the members of their congregation as well as their community. You know, it's it's not it's you know you sort of live that live that out into the larger world. And so certainly those practical measures are one, you know, one piece that that people of faith can play. Um, there's the role of advocacy in terms of, you know, policy advocacy specifically, and sometimes that's in the local community, or it can be, you know, in your state, in your in your national um, policy arena. Um, and then there's also the role of, you know, communicating on climate, right? You know, advancing this moral message on climate so that we can talk about the issue of climate change from a values-based and ethical and moral standpoint versus, um, you know, a business standpoint or, you know, some of the other viewpoints that are important, but are not really sort of in our wheelhouse, right? Um, so I'm, I'm curious to know, um, and Ibrahim, let's let's start with you. I, I'm curious to know what you see as the role of, of people of faith, not specifically clergy, but sort of the broader swath of, of people of faith in addressing the climate crisis. I think, you know, uh, it is a very important uh, issue. We have to think about that. Let me just say, I just attended a panel discussion at the COP26 in, in Glasgow, and there was a psychologist, an eco-psychologist. She presented herself, Nikki Harre, Professor Nikki Harre. And she said, you know, if you're, you know, you're, uh, you're, uh, to, you, you, you're uh, you know, whatever you do for, uh, to mitigate the environment doesn't work, it doesn't matter. It works for your spiritual health because you are thinking you are on the side, uh, right side. You are uh, you, you you are doing uh, uh, good not only for yourself, for, for for the nature and for the others. Just this feeling makes you happy. And clinically, clinically, she said, I am. I just uh, you know, I I I, I just uh, came to the, this conclusion. When people are disconnected from nature and they, they lost hope and they are just depressed and just they just you know a lot of psychological problems. So just two decades ago, there were almost no books on eco-psychology. But now there's a dozens of books, a lot of, a lot of books. See? So in the same way, I think uh, Professor Lynn White, when he uh, wrote his historical article in, in, in 1967, uh, uh, the historical roots of our ecological crisis, and he blamed Christianity, Judaism, and also Abrahamic religions about, you know, they don't care about environment or there's also uh, one, maybe one cause of the, uh, the, the problem. But I think he, he very intelligently, he, provo he, pro he provocated the religious leader, just look at your tradition, your legacy with the new eyes, just reinterpret your text, reinterpret, you know, uh, your, your legacy. This is why you know, we have hundred books on uh, you know uh, Christian Christian ethics or Christian or Jewish ethics, uh, environmental ethics, Islamic environmental ethics. We here at Üsküdar University uh, uh, founded the, uh, the, the the forum on environmental ethics. This is the first forum in the Muslim world. I just you know sometimes I'm I, I couldn't say I am proud of that to be founding president of this forum. There must be hundreds of them who can present young people with, and also religious communities to remind them to look at their tradition, to come up with some new, new ideas. And also, this is why we are just now we have a big uh, project. Also, we uh, have some funds from the uh, European Climate Foundation, you know, to just uh, to, 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 to change the minds of teachers and also minds of religious leaders, imams in Turkey. Once we change the, the minds of teachers and also the minds of religious leaders, imam, then we can reach the gra grassroots. Then we can uh, we can make a change. I think. Thank you. Thank thanks for that insight. And and so Dan, of course, I want to turn to you now <laughs> and get and get your thoughts. Um, any re any responses to Ibrahim first of all, and then your own thoughts on the role of people of faith. 
Um, yeah, I think what I have to say is in line with what Ibrahim was saying. Um, the there's a great role to be played by ordinary grassroots people of faith in the climate change age in terms of um, developing more wholesome and more beneficial and more positive mental outlooks um, in terms of helping humans to, to better navigate the non-human natural world and helping the non-human natural world to survive the depredations of humans. Um, in the Buddhist world, I, I'm reminded here of an example from Japan. Um, in Japan, it's really expensive to die. Japanese funerals are, are just sky high. And so some Japanese Buddhists were originally motivated a, uh, to find a new way to die. <laughs> but they also felt a sense of responsibility for the climate and for the non-human natural world around them. So they developed a movement in which you become buried in a forest. And these Buddhist groups in Japan have adopted their own forests and they've cleaned out um, invasive species so that they can return the forest to uh, being as primal as they, as they possibly can be. Um, they've regenerated the forest so that the, the forest land is healthier. And then they use this regenerated forest land as burial plots. Um, you can either um, have your ashes thrown in a hole and have a tree planted right on top of your ashes, or you can have your ashes buried at the foot of a tree that is already existent. Um, in this way, the people save a lot of money. It's way cheaper to get buried this way. But what has happened over time is that people have forgotten about the, the inexpense, inexpensive nature of this uh, method of burial. And they focused on the green eco-friendly aspects of this. Instead of being buried in concrete, Japanese folks more and more are being buried in dirt where they decompose more quickly. Um, these folks who are getting buried in the forest, they buck Japanese tradition, which is to get buried in an urn, which won't disintegrate very quickly. Instead, they, they dispense with the urn altogether. They want their ashes in the ground so that they will disperse very, very quickly. And there's a Buddhist ideology here. The idea is that you want the atoms of your body to disintegrate and get spread through the ecosystem to benefit other beings out of compassion. So they see this as a Buddhist compassion way to get buried. But needless to say, this um, entire uh, burial process is very eco-friendly in terms of climate change. It does not produce the um, nasty gases that, um, that can be do produced by other burial methods. And they're regenerating forests at the same time. And this just all happened on, on the ground by uh, grassroots groups who uh, slowly through time ad hoc developed this way of acting in the world. And so it shows how just average grassroots spiritual people can, how they can reinterpret their tradition in light of climate change and come up with some really dynamic and creative responses. Um, and I look forward to seeing more creative and dynamic responses like this coming from spiritual people from many different faiths. Mm, wonderful. Ibrahim, did you want to jump in? Yeah, in fact, when uh, I, look, I look at, uh, you know, I'm just trying to understand uh, the uh, histor history of, you know, uh, environmental history in Turkey, in, 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 in the Muslim uh, societies. Uh, one good source is the uh, Western travelers, 18th and 19th century, who visited just from Germany to Jerusalem or from Marseille to Jerusalem. They just passed through the Istanbul and all, all Anatolia. One of them is Edward Lane, who, who, who lived in Cairo more than 10 years. And the other one is Alfonso Lamartine, who lived in Istanbul for several months. And he knows uh, 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 Turkey very well. When I look at them, they just, as Dan said, they say they just they're 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 impressed with the uh, in people's interaction with the nature and with the animals. 
and they just say they, for example, uh, they, they 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 say there is some certain form, um, uh, endowments for 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 care of animals. Rich people, they it was a custom don't to uh, uh, leave his or her legacy to her children. They just they have done their best to give them good education. Then they you can go by yourself. Then they uh, donated their uh, they, they, their uh, wealth to, to to the foundational pur purposes. There, there, there are a lot of good examples. For example, animal hospitals or the foundation for the care of uh, you know birds and also migration birds, etc. Uh, but what is important here is you know is 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 is, is to, to to understand. Uh, also, there's a uh, Greg asked in the question uh, question box about indigenous people perception of nature. We have to learn from them. Neuro, I just, you know, I just read a new article about neuroscience, how our brains work and also creates knowledge. It is not like what uh, 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 John Locke or other epistemologists tell us. No, the brain has very interaction with nature. And through this interaction, it, it says, uh, it, it, we assume it, the, they, the indigenous people, they get the message from the from the from the uh, the nature as the what, which which you know uh, plant is good for my eye which is good which is a medicine for my stomach they they they, they didn't discover this uh, they is the article says we assume by experiments as we are doing now they have a spiritual bond with the nature always they just this is why uh, american indigenous people they say to, to to nature, my bro, my 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 brother, my sister, they just feel like a member of like their families. It is also in the Islamic Sufi tradition. We have some Sufis. They also call animals as their brothers and sisters. And also we have uh, Francis uh, as uh, of Assisi. The same thing. So it is a universal phenomenon. Some people they feel it. No, I think this is why I said or gathering or co conversation or dialogue is so vital and important to just respond to these questions and also to, to open up new avenues for uh, young people to, to study. I met at the new, uh, new, new, new school in New York City, a young uh, uh, American uh, scholar who did his PhD on uh, indigenous people in, 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 in the West. And he stayed with them for four years. And with his dissertation, he changed a lot of things or a lot of uh, stereotypes about indigenous people you know all this you know it is part of, of the past this is why i i use the ideology many of ideologies on mind just blinded us to see new things to see the whole picture and also to to give a or uh, hearing to, to to listen to them if there because we are so uh, you know uh, uh, proud of ourselves, we know everything. We are the center of the world and the universe. No, this is wrong. We have to be humble. Mm. Well, I'm, and I'm super glad that you jumped in on the question that was that's it, was in the Q and A. Um, what might be the role of the religions and spirituality of indigenous and native peoples regarding the climate and environmental crisis? So, you've you've. Um, provided a nice framework for thinking about that. And Dan, I, I wondered if you wanted to um, comment further uh, with regards to that question. Um, yes, yeah. please go ahead. There, there's a lot that can be said here. Um, indigenous traditions from uh, different locales have a tremendous amount of material that they can contribute to the climate change age, they have a, a, a tremendous contributions that they can be making. Um, I'll highlight one very specific thing. Um, love for stones and stony places. Notice that we can't fight climate change without loving rocks, because one of the things that we want to do to fight climate change is to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it back in the ground where it belongs. Right? This is where, where global warming comes from. We freed too much carbon that should be in the ground. We freed it into the air. We need to return it back to the ground. 
And so there are a number of carbon sequestration strategies that are being developed by uh, private companies and universities where we try to draw uh, carbon down into water, into seawater especially, or into stone formations. Um, to do this, though, begs, our, begs the question of what is our ethical valuation of stone? Um, and the problem is with a lot of the major religious traditions, they don't have an answer to this. Um, I'm here to talk about Buddhism today. I could talk about other religions in this life, but I'll just stick to Buddhism. Buddhism traditionally has put high value on human beings, has put high value on animals in terms of environmental entities, but has put almost no value at all on rocks. Good luck finding passages in the Buddhist scriptures that tell us that we must care for rocks and, and cherish them as part of our natural environment. It's just not part of the, the traditional Buddhist way of thinking. But if we're going to battle climate change, like I mentioned, we have to think this way. We have to think about the roles of bodies of water and rocks and, and other environmental entities that aren't sentient, that aren't animals. And the Buddhist tradition does not think about these non-sentient entities uh, in any real deep way. But to the question, many indigenous traditions do. Uh, many indigenous traditions hold, um, especially stones, for instance, in high regard. I'm thinking here of the um, Sioux Native American creation story in which the entire universe was created by the highest God of all, which is rock. In this traditional Sioux universe, instead of having stones being environmental afterthoughts, here it is stone that is at the, the very center of our environmental concern. And we need more of this. We need to have more concern for rocks and rocky places in themselves. And we need to have more concern for water and watery places in themselves. And this is something that indigenous traditions can teach us that the high traditions don't teach us as well. Mm, thank you. That's that's very insightful. And and you know, I, I always think there's sort of a danger of overly romanticizing, you know, indigenous and, and native cultures and peoples. Um, and so I I, you know, am I try to stay away from that, but you know, as I was thinking about. Um, one way of, of, of responding to this goes back to our earlier conversation about overconsumption, which is thinking about um, Native cultures as only taking what is needed. Um, you know, so, so thinking about, you know, you don't, you don't sort of, you know, go out and, and mass slaughter animals um, for the joy of the hunt or whatever you might want to say instead you know you take an animal and you give thanks for the life of that animal and you you know you you take what you need for your community or for your family and you know i think that that sort of way of thinking of of what is enough um you know and what is too much um is is you know is sort of central to the a native a native culture that would say, you know, we take only what we need uh, in order to survive, and we we think about the natural world in balance um, and that inner interconnectedness and 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 uh, inner spiritual nature of of the of the world. So um, that was really beautiful, and um, I didn't know Ibrahim if you had anything else that you wanted to add as we were. As we were responding yeah. to this, you started you started on this, and I just wanted to give yeah, you. I just I just I just want to uh, add what uh, the Dan said uh, from uh, 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 Muslim Sufis, because the Quran presents the everything in the world as a as a, uh, as a indication, a sign of God's power, wisdom, beauty. Therefore, we call the praises of the Quran as as ayat ayat, and also. We use all things in every the universe, everything is an ayah. So an uh, 18th century uh, uh, Sufi poet from Damascus, he say, uh, you know, he say, reflect upon the, uh, the, 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 the lines of the earth because everything is a letter, is, is a letter from the divine to you. Mm -hmm. This means, you know, 
sometimes they say they just feel when they was you know when we are uh, when we are uh, when we want to make uh, our daily prayer we have to wash our hands and face and make wudu we say ablution and they say they don't walk without ablution because they say every everywhere is a sacred everywhere is the the eyes of uh, of god of course yes we consume we eat but when we also we eat meat uh, is or different from buddhism and hinduism but there was a new phd thesis at harvard university about the muslims ethics of slaughtering animals very interesting i just learned so much from it but we there is also uh, 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 animal rights uh, 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 activist and also former ambassador from UK, she wrote an excellent book about the uh, animals in religions. And she uh, very kindly sent uh, her chapter on Islam. I am amazed by her insight and her scholarship and her, her objectivity to be ob objective to, to present other religions. This is also a good indication of dialogue and, and learning from each other. You see, all these are news in the past. They, there was a lot of orientalists they even they don't need to talk uh, with a native they just learn the language they say we know the <laughs> we, we know the the natives we know the indigenous people but now there is a new generation they want to discover by themselves that they they they, they, uh, they, they, they want to enlarge their perspective and they, they they are bringing us also new hope mm -hmm. mm. great it's wonderful and and as we turn to uh, the next question i just want to remind folks to go ahead if you have questions um, drop them into the q a function uh, on zoom and we will turn to those questions shortly but i want to i want to turn us to um you know the idea of activism you know what what it is you know that we that that we do right that uh not just what we think about but what we actually do to respond to the climate crisis and um, we've talked a little bit about this uh, around the edges already, um, but thinking about, you know, your own activist work or the activist work of your, of the community that you're involved with, uh, I'm just, I'm curious to see what, to hear what you think about the, the strengths and what are the strengths and successes that you have seen from, from your viewpoint so far, either of your own work or the work of others in your community. So, Dan, I want to start with you. Okay. Well, um, to reiterate something that I said before, it, it seems to me from a Buddhist point of view, environmental action seems to um, most commonly spring from a sense of interconnectedness and a sense of compassion, too. Um, and this seems to drive a great deal of Buddhist environmentalism. I see a polar bear who is suffering I feel like I must act to benefit that polar bear somehow. Um, and it is this <clears throat> sense of connection combined with compassion that drives a, a, a tremendous amount of Buddhist environmental activism. Um, I'm thinking here right now of Trashi Dorje and other people like him in Tibet who have struggled to develop um, uh, reserves for wildlife um, uh, against their own government that wanted to use land for commercial purposes, but they struggled and in, in, in some cases risked their own lives uh, to develop these reserves out of compassion for the wild animals that they see around them. And um, these activists in Tibet are really hamstrung by the political situation that they are in living within the People's Republic of China and still they have had several victories on the ground creating um, reserves for wildlife uh, precisely against um, the, the kind of uh, headwinds, negative headwinds that I was mentioning. It, it's really inspiring to see this happen. It's really inspiring to see them do what they do. And it's not just these Buddhists in Tibet trying to develop reserves. There's the Sarvadaya movement in Sri Lanka, which is trying to uh, create fight climate change by uh, improving our land use patterns. There are the, the people in Japan that I talked about um, seeking funerals and so on, uh, better funerals. 
And here in the United States, there's a lot of Buddhist climate activism that goes on. If you go to a climate uh, rally, for instance, um, it's not going to be too terribly long before you run into a Buddhist who is there. And again, it, it all springs from Buddha, a sense of Buddhist interconnectedness uh, combined with Buddhist compassion. And it's really easy to get down in the face of climate change. It's really easy to fall into despair. And I have to show my appreciation for um, the, the real go-getters that I find around me in the Buddhist world who inspire me and energize me by the way that they themselves rise to the occasion um, to try to produce a, a, a cleaner and greener world for the next generation. Mm, that's great. Yeah, and, and I, I appreciate so much that you, you know, name some of the very real obstacles as well, right? That, that these things don't just sort of magically happen, um, you know, that, that there is a lot of, uh, you know, very, in some cases, very hostile pushback to some of these initiatives. Um, and it, and some of that can be from, you know, other individuals in the community. And sometimes it's from, from government, right? We, we find, you know, sort of a lot of levels of resistance to change uh, when we think about this work. But Ibrahim, I want to bring you into this conversation too about, you know, the strengths and successes uh, that you've seen um, from your perspective. Uh, thank you. Uh, this also gives me an opportunity, you know, to, to, to say so, something about my activism and also my colleagues. I was, you know, we are uh, as the Forum on Environmental Ethics, we are informing our, uh, our, our public about uh, critical issues on environment, about new developments. For example, for the first time, we put the, the, the Dalai Lama's, he says that Dalai Lama's uh, views of, of, of environment and uh, in, on our website in Turkish. Also, Laodata says full text and also all other religious leaders, even indigenous people, we summarize all their views and we uh, published it on our website, which is in Turkish. And also the European Climate Foundation, uh, this is, they founded us. Besides this, I think I was also part of the Islamic declaration, climate change declaration in, 20, in 2015. But most importantly, in the last two years, uh, with cooperation with the UNEP, we are working on a, a very uh, critical doc document. It is El Mizan, a covenant for the earth. This is going to be the first Muslim declaration about uh, the Muslim declaration on environment and what em environment means for us. It is it presents it presents an Islamic outlook of the environment in a bit that strengthens local, regional, and international action that combat climate change and other threats to the planet. It is a global endeavor to engage Islamic scholars and Muslim institutions in the development and uh, uh, adoption of the call. This is why we included representative of all Muslim uh, uh, major groups, major uh, you know. Uh, sects and school of talks and also uh, we, we, there is we, we, there is a uh, among us there is muslim uh, uh, woman uh, environmentalist and we sent our document to 300 uh, institutions and people with a democratic spirit we just took the feedbacks in uh, next uh, month month we will present uh, it as uh, uh, no we sent it to copy editor this week most probably, then it will be presented to the, the UN. What is important, it just is a call for not only for leaders of the Muslim world, also to the youth, also to higher education institutions, also to the imams, to all, you know, to be, uh, to first to understand they have a problem. Second, they can, they can do something to, to mitigate the problem. Third, if they don't do anything, they are morally responsible. On religious, on religious grounds, we just we, we supported all the text. We are. It is a moral imperative for us to be a part of the solution, to to work with anyone who has who is working to mitigate this problem. So the the the, the, the covenant is a restatement of you know uh, a restatement of principles governing the protection of nature in a form that meets the current challenges. 
uh, and examines the ethics behind the social patterning of human existence. So, you know, uh, I think, uh, and uh, uh, as I am the first Muslim uh, scholar who has a PhD on the subject, now I am uh, supervising a lot of ma master thesis and PhD thesis from Kazakhstan to Algeria, from Munich, from Germany to Indonesia. And these young people working with, with these young people just also, you know, strengthens my hope. Mm -hmm. You know, what I, what I love about what both of you have shared is, you know, the, the sort of all levels of approach that are happening, right? From the very grassroots, locally led initiatives that are happening to, you know, the, these global, you know, this beautiful statement that, that you're working on, Ibrahim, and, and how, you know, how that provides leadership for others uh, in, in the Muslim and non-Muslim world, right? Um, in much the same way, when we think about Pope Francis, you know, issuing the encyclical Laudato Si, that it was, it was a statement um, from, you know, the Catholic Pope, um, but also more broadly addressed to the world. And I think, you know, we see this similar model here where it can very much guide religious leaders, uh, the imams, as you said, um, and, um, you know, work its way to the mosques and, and making sure that that those, uh, you know, that individuals are aware that this is important, that this is a critical piece of work. Um, so I think, you know, that example of it sort of taking um, this, this approach of, of everyone, right? We think about the top-down approach, we think about the bottom-up approach and like, how are we squeezing the policymakers in between um, to actually take take real action and um you know for us here with interfaith power and light here and here in the u.s um you know i think a lot about our work uh in just that way because we have a national office um, but we also have uh, folks at the grassroots level across the country who are who are activists who are really you know pushing this work forward at the local level and you know, it takes that relationship building, it takes that collaboration, um, you know, in much the same way it takes this, you know, broader conversation about the multi-faith approach to this um, in order to really build an effective movement on, on climate change. And, you know, I think about the fact that it was the work of activists here in the U.S. over decades, let's be, be real, <laughs> over decades, uh, that led recently to the passage of the largest climate uh, funding initiative by the U.S. government through the Inflation Reduction Act that just passed the Senate um, on Sunday. And uh, we'll go to the House of Representatives on Friday. Uh, and, you know, we, we are very hopeful that it will pass there and be signed into law. But we know that, you know, work like that, um, none of us can do it alone. You know, we're not, it's not one organization, it's not one individual, um, it's not one religious tradition, it's, you know, it is partnerships and working together that is the, the real strength that we bring to the climate movement. Um, so, you know, for sure, as you've named, we, we have obstacles, right? There are definitely, um, you know, special interests that are opposing our work, uh, not only in the U.S., but globally on, on climate initiatives. Um, you know, there are governments that are, are uh, not on board uh, with all of the things that we desire in terms of addressing the climate crisis. Um, and, you know, Dan, you also said, and I think this is so significant, there is despair, right? I mean, the despair is paralyzing, you know, when we think that there's no hope for, you know, for a, a better future um, and to change the business as usual mindset, um, you know, people really walk away from this 
you know, fr from any kind of advocacy or activism when they think that there's no hope to make a difference. And, and I think, um, you know, I think indifference is another real obstacle that we have in this work, you know, people um, who don't care about this issue for whatever reason, or also people who care, but just don't take action. You know, they might think this is an important issue, but uh, they're not getting out to, um, you know, to push for change. Um, and in the US, one of the, you know, one of the initiatives, one of the things we are saying is you need to vote. You know, you need to, you need to vote on, uh, on climate as, you know, as an issue and, um, you know, evaluate candidates based on, um, based on their stance on working on climate change. And we do that in a very nonpartisan way. We're not endorsing candidates, you know, um, or political parties, but we are saying, you know, educate yourself on the issue and educate yourself on, on the candidates and um, vote your conscience and vote your values based on that. And so, um, you know, those are some, those are some ways I know that we're working on this issue. And I'm curious, Ibrahim, if you're, you know, from your perspective, you know, what other obstacles do you think that, that we're encountering um, in terms of, you know, active resistance to working on climate? I think uh, this is very important questions because all governments in, in also, they are trying to be developed like the US, like Germany, like France. But when we look at the resources, natural resources, this is not sufficient in the same way. So it, we don't want to, we don't say, don't, uh, uh, you know, uh, solve our problems or don't uh, utilize nature, but we have to, we have to change our perception, which we, you know, inherited from from the legacy of the uh, last century, which was, you know, the, for example, there are some seas in there are Marmara Sea. There's almost on the uh, you know dying because of the old industrialized region. It is in, 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 involved by industrial regions, and all is polluted by the, the industry. Uh, and, uh, industry. So they just assume it, it will not, nothing will happen if the sea. No, we understood the nature is the seas, the oceans is this also like us alive, you know, they, they have a life, they have a system, they have a balance. They have, so I think this is the European Union. They just accepted the new green deal. You know, we are not against development. We are against a mentality which is not sustainable. You see, or politicians, they have to change their mentality. Mm. You know, this is why, you know, for example, in Turkey, just signed the uh, Paris Accord just uh, after six years and now changed the, the name of Ministry of Environment as a Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. You know, that because just the government also see the especially young people, they care about environment. What you are doing to the forest, your policy about the forest, uh, your policy about the future. These young people are going to live in the future, not the old people. No, the politicians who are deciding for us, they will not be in the future with, uh, with our children and grandchildren. But the problems created by their policy will be there. This We have to make this very clear to the young people. We have to talk with them. This is why I'm just uh, uh, keeping, you know, a link and talking to young people and uh, telling them you must to care about your future and your grandchildren. You know we are we are we are we are we have to talk. To, 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 I I have to to remind you. You have to think for yourself. Mm -hmm. This is Gerata Thunberg is a very good example. For us. Very inspiring and thank you for your work with with young people, um, both of you, um, over over the years that you've been uh, teaching and inspiring our young people. It's, it's incredible work. And um, we do have a, we have a question for you from um, our audience. Uh, and the question is, can you please address the importance of individual slash collective prayer? Uh, I'll add meditation or whatever way you uh, frame your uh, meditative life, um, prayer for the resolution of the ecological crisis in your religion, Buddhist, Christian, and Muslim. So Dan, I'd love to start with you and, and give us a reflection on how you would frame this from a Buddhist perspective. 
Well, okay. And, and it certainly is a, a fair question, given the importance of prayer and many forms of religion. Unfortunately, this question, when posed to the Buddhist guy, is kind of hard. <laughs> because uh, unlike in some other religious forms, some Buddhists pray, but other Buddhists don't. And so for some Buddhists, prayer has absolutely nothing to do with their response to global warming and uh, climate change. But there are Tibetan Buddhists who do believe in prayer. They do believe in praying to enlightened beings for help and wisdom. And without a doubt, I know many Tibetan Buddhists who uh, util utilize prayer in just this way. Um, if I can be more universal about all Buddhists, I would say if I change the word from prayer to meditation, then I can say that the Buddhists across traditions, many of them are uh, meditating hard on the question of what do we do about global warming? I know of many Buddhists that this is their central meditative question. Um, the Buddha taught us to ask in meditation, who am I? With the idea that if we ask that question enough, we will um, come to a very deep spiritual place. Um, and many Buddhists these days are kind of changing that question a little bit to be, who am I in the climate change age? And they are meditating on that. And that is bringing about some um, really interesting and creative responses like the forest burials um, that I was talking about before. Um, but I guess that's how it works out in, in Buddhism in terms of prayer. Mm. What about you folks? How about in your traditions? Yeah, yeah. In fact, you know, the Quran presents uh, Abraham, Prophet Abraham, uh, Abraham as a role model for us. It's, 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 it, and also, there are many prayers of he, uh, him in, in the Quran. We are repeating in our daily day prayers. His uh, Quran uh, presents uh, young Ibrahim not only um, as a young man burning for learning, also a man of faith, commitment, sincerity, hospitality, and integrity. And in his search for meaning, uh, Ibrahim finds his God as the sustainer of the old world, uh, who has created and guided us. And he says, God is the one who gives me uh, God's uh, sorry for that God is the one who gives me uh, to eat and to drink and when I fall ill he is the one who restores me to health so it is very holistic perception of God so we say we repeat his prayers for example and say uh, we also we finished our uh, uh, mizan uh, a covenant for dirt with a prayer we ask the lord of all beings to guide us all of humankind to mend the devastation in the in the earth that we as as a species and as individuals we wrought to cease distorting his creation to return the natural way of god on which he originated us and to bear in the mind that the servants of all merciful are those who walk gently on the earth. And we say, oh God, give us uh, goodness in this world and also the, the hereafter. The beauty of this world. And so, so it's also moral responsibility. You know, we have to bring good here and also hereafter. Our goodness in, 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 in hereafter depends on our goodness or moral life towards whole creation therefore when we say for example in every morning i say I, when i say oh god just you know help me to to do something not only for my family my children my grandchildren for the whole creation this is why i just when i i i come out from home i say good morning to the birds i could say good morning to the cats of istanbul i say good morning to the dogs you see i just feel then one day to to teenagers, they ask me, what, 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 what are you speaking to the dogs? I said, I saw the good morning to you. Then I told them, I am a professor, I am a dean, I am an environmentalist, and the philosophy be, be, beyond this, they were so relaxed, they were so happy. Just we need you know, to, to, to show that in all prayers, in all academic life, in all, uh, you know, as an activist, 
we care for all, not on, only for ourselves. I think one feature we all share is that we are not selfish people, just who care for themselves. We care for others. Mm. Well, and I, I, I'm going to generalize a little bit <laughs> from the Christian tradition. You know, we're so broad, right? There's so, uh, so many differences. Um, but I think one challenge that I find is that that prayer has often become uh, a time to ask God for something. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes we're not even asking necessarily for uh, uh, the right things. You know, we're going back to that materialism uh, question we had earlier. We're asking for stuff or, you know, something good to happen to us. Um, in my own personal practice of prayer, um, I start with a gratitude practice, which um, provides an opportunity to acknowledge the good that I al already have or that already exists. And so, um, you know, gratitude for the birds singing uh, in the morning is, you know, often a part of that, um, you know, or uh, some beauty in the world or some relationship, which um, I think, you know, to me, relation, the relationships are more important than the stuff, right? When you get down to what's important in life. And, um, you know, and I, I think about the stories of, of, you know, Jesus often going to a quiet place to pray, you know, to sort of uh, get away from the crowds and find that, find that inner peace um, and connection. Um, and so I think about turning that um, that prayer around to be more of, you know, how can I serve in the world um, and listening for that answer. Um, so to, there's, there's a certain amount, I think, that we tend to skip over, which is the, the listening part, right? You know, it's, it's, we talk a lot during prayer or inside our heads, but um, but the stopping and listening um, for the still small voice, if you will, is, uh, is, is um, needs to be a very important centering part of, of that prayer. And in many ways is like meditation uh, in that regard. So, um, you know, I think getting ourselves away from the question of, you know, please God, I need this, 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 and this, to how can I, you know, first of all, I want to express gratitude to you and, and also how can I serve in this world um, provides us with a really different framework for, uh, for thinking about how we work on climate and our being grounded in sort of our spiritual values that we have uh, versus the desire for more. Um, and I, I'm reminded uh, in the Jewish tradition, uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, uh, it writes beautifully about, um, about awe. And, and it reminds me of this, this gratitude piece, which is, you know, sort of acknowledging that um, the world is bigger than we realize. It's bigger than us. And that we stand in awe of the grandeur of God. And, um, and I find that when I have conversations with people and you ask where someone feels most connected to the holy or the, the sacred, it is often in places of nature and the natural world. It's, you know, oceans and mountains and trees and, um, you know, the garden, you know, all, all these, these places. So I think it's much more, um, you know, it's, it's much more natural and grounding for, for folks to name uh, those places as places where they feel spiritually fulfilled and connected to the sacred. So I love that question about the importance of prayer, but also thinking beyond prayer about where we feel connected um, to, uh, to the sacred. So that was, that was lovely. And I want to, I want to ask both of you, um, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about hope, which I think is, is beautiful. We've all named it uh, as a part of of this conversation today. And I, 
I'm curious to know where you are personally finding hope right now. And so Ibrahim, I really want to start with you. Where, where are you finding hope? You know, when I uh, try, I want to, uh, you know, recharge my, my smartphone, I connect it to, 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 to electricity. So with the, the, with the Quranic perception and the Quranic frame, when I look at the nature, everything gives me hope because there is a creation every moment. Mm. There's a creation is going on. When I'm aware of this creation, I connect myself with the creator, then I said, I must be hopeful. See, and this is why in, 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 in the true sense in Islam, the, the prayer is not a passive act to just to run away from the, 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 the real stuff and just uh, 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 pray God and to, 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 to fix things for you. We have to use your full energy, but realizing your human, you know, human, human capacity, connect with the divine, said, you know, this from this, it, I, I, I seek your help. I seek your guidance. So it is very real. I, I just, this is why I'm, I'm, uh, in, uh, I just enjoy environment and in, in, to, to study the book of universe. I really, I, I really, you know, when I am with the nature, when I just, with the, I just, I could, I could watch a flying bird for, 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 for a long time. It just inspires me. I forget everything. See, we just lost this old connection with the, with the nature, with the universe, you know. So I think we have to really connect with our, 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 our roots. Mm. Wow, beautiful. There's a creation every moment. I, I just love that. Um, and Dan, how about you? Where are you finding hope? Well, one place to find hope from a Buddhist point of view is to uh, understand the Buddhist concept of Buddha nature. Um, in the Mahayana Buddhist scriptures, the Buddha taught that we all have Buddha nature. That is, we all are already enlightened Buddhas already. We just need to wake up to the inner spiritual riches that we already possess. According to this way of looking at the world, we all already have the wisdom we need. We all already have the compassion that we need. We just need to unlock our inner doors and, and let all that energy out. And this way of looking at the world helps to provide uh, some kind of hope because it gives us a, a positive sense of what humans can do. And, and if I can take this um, kind of religious doctrine and put it in terms of uh, actual social processes, what I see happening around me is that the world is changing. I don't know if it's changing fast enough, but it is changing and this change does give me hope. This very discussion would not have happened 30 or 40 years ago, at least not with the intensity with which we are talking about environmental issues. So this very discussion is a sign that things have changed. Um, and I can go out on the street and there are people talking about driving hybrid cars and that's not good enough just to buy a hybrid. That doesn't mean you've solved global warming, but it's a move in the right direction. If 30% of the people are talking about buying a hybrid and it was only 10% 10 years ago or whatever, I'm just throwing out numbers here. But the idea is that more people are thinking about this. So we're moving in the right direction. Again, I don't know if we're moving there quickly enough, but you can see the signs around us that we are moving in the right direction. And um, I, being a teacher, I would be remiss if I didn't throw in this last part. My students help to give me a lot of hope because they see the world in a different way than, than I do and, and many people from my generation do. And that's a good thing. And they are full of energy. They are full of a sense of responsibility for the environment around us, if I can put it that way, that maybe humanity has not always had. And so interacting with my students and seeing how excited and motivated they can be about environmental issues, um, that gives me a lot of hope for the future too. And I see Ibrahim nodding about students, so I can see he concurs with that. And and I and I agree with with what both of you said. And and I would say, um, 
you know, for me, you know, sort of seeing um, the, for example, the passage of the, um, of, of the uh, new legislation here in the Senate in the US, um, you know, I'm hoping for sort of a, a sea change, if you will, in terms of, um, you know, activists finally feeling a win and a, and a shift um, in, in maybe how we can, uh, as the US, address uh, the issue of climate change and, 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 you know, really take leadership and lower our own uh, emissions here in the US. And I would say even further than that, um, the centering of equity and justice within this movement is very inspiring to me. Um, and a lot of that has come from the energy of young people. It's come from the energy of uh, black and indigenous leaders uh, here in the US and in other places in the world and, and listening to uh, other voices that um, need to not only be at the table, but to be in leadership at the table. And I think that that is a big shift that has happened, you know, even in the last few years. So I want to acknowledge that, you know, I find that also to be incredibly hopeful that not only will we address the climate crisis, but we will do it with equity uh, and justice so that uh, it, is, it is fair for, uh, for all, and in particular for those who have been uh, historically marginalized in these conversations. Um, so uh, just beautiful, you know, beautiful sort of uh, hopeful places to land on. Um, and this idea of, you know, we're, we all already have Buddha nature, we just need to wake up. I, I just appreciate that so much. We can call on uh, all of us to wake up uh, to, the, to our own Buddha nature. Um, and uh, at this point, I want to turn it back over uh, to Allison. She's going to close us out. And I want to just give a huge thank you to Dan and to Ibrahim. I feel like I've learned so much from you today. And it's just been a real blessing to me personally. Um, I, re I really appreciate both of your perspectives on this and, and the really fruitful conversation that we've had. So uh, thank you and blessings to both of you. And Allison, I will turn it over uh, to you to close us out. Thank you, Susan. What a beautiful, incredible discussion you all have had. I'm, I'm really very moved and I also learned a tremendous amount from each of you. I think something that really came through to me was the idea of cooperation, because if we're going to build a movement, we have to work together. So I thought that was really important for us to take in and think about. And, and I think also so many times the equity and justice piece that, um, that Susan, you represent, that you've worked so hard with, that that's just something that we, it does get shoved aside and we've got to do better about that. <laughs> and then the other thing was Ibrahim, I wanna thank you for, for explaining where the moral compass comes from, from religions, because for years I've been talking about the moral compass and I kept saying to myself, where did I get that from? I mean, you know, I thought, I knew I didn't make it up. So I'm so happy to have a little bit of a, of a uh, professor, professor explaining to me where they, this, um, I want to also especially thank Reverend Steve Alpert for inviting all of us to this incredible discussion and giving us the space to participate in the Interfaith Awareness Week, which is happening this whole week. So there's, there's many, many wonderful other discussions to tune into. So um, keep, keep that in mind, everyone. And I want to thank those who are, are participating by listening and giving us your questions and your concerns and um, also financially supporting the Temple of Outstanding. We appreciate every, every bit of it. So the next interfaith uh, discussion that the Temple of Understanding is putting on our next Eco Justice for All dialogue series is going to be myself discussing something that I that is dear to my heart. It's called the soil of life. And I'm going to be talking to Ray Archuleta, who is a professor of soil science. He is probably best known 
kiss the earth, kiss the soil. Um, he's he's a he's a farmer. He has a, a a farm which is dear to my heart. Once upon a time, I had a a going Jersey farm, but I uh, I now just have a little garden. <laughs> but I'm ex very excited about the program, which is going to be on September 1st from 10 to 11. So thank you all. This has been really a profound and beautiful experience. Bless you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Mm -hmm.